welcome to A Closer Look, Prince Then and Now. I'm Jenny Gibbs, Executive Director of the IFPDA and the IFPDA Foundation. A Closer Look, Prince Then and Now, a series of free talks today and the following two Fridays, co-organized by the Print Council of America and the International Print Center of New York, IPCNY, with support from the IFPDA Foundation. This series of talks is part of Print Month, which is held in conjunction with the IFPDA Fine Art Print Fair, which is currently online at Artsy. The series pairs an artist from IPCNY's current online and in-person exhibition, Living in America, with a print curator to share insights through close looking at work from their, their respective curatorial and studio practices. The exhibition Living in America was curated by Assembly Room and is also supported in part by the IFPDA Foundation. Today's program, which is the first in this series, is entitled Form Through Darkness. It pairs curator Rena Hoisington with artist William Villalongo to look at his work alongside the works of paper, works on paper of Jean-Jacques Lacanet. Dr. Rena Hoisington is curator of Old Master Prints at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Prior to her appointment, Dr. Hoisington worked at the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Wadsworth Athenaeum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Morgan Library. She's also taught art history at the Johns Hopkins University and Stony Brook University. Currently, she's researching an exhibition on the development of aquatint in Europe in the second half of the 18th century that will open at the National Gallery in October 2021. William Villalongo is a Brooklyn-based artist and associate professor at the Cooper Union School of I want to thank Judy Hecker, director of the International Print Center in New York, who helped to brainstorm possibilities for this program. And of course, I'd like to thank my collaborator, the artist, the extraordinary artist, Will Villalongo, who I am looking forward to meeting in person one day. I also want to thank you all for listening to this boiled down version of my research on La Grenée. All right. Versatility was a quality that was expected of and very much appreciated in the work of 18th century French history painters. And Jean-Jacques La Grenée the Younger was no exception. He and his older brother, Louis-Jean La Grenée, were both high ranking members of the Academy Royale des Peintures et des Sculptures the most prestigious arts institution in pre-revolutionary France. One of the many benefits of Academy membership was having the privilege to exhibit one's work at the public biennial salon at the Louvre, which La Grenet did on a regular basis. His many submissions showed him to be an artist whose work ranged broadly in terms of subject matter, style, scale, and media. And here I'm going to show you two works that he exhibited in the 1775 Salon when he became a full member of the Academy Royale. First is Winter, or the god Aeolus releasing the winds that cover the mountains with snow. This mammoth canvas was an official state commission he completed in 1775 and formed part of the extended seal, uh, ceiling of the Apollo Gallery in the Louvre. I'm using my cursor to show you where this is. La Grenet was no less adept in his creation of works on paper. Here in his 1775 drawing of the angel appearing to the shepherds in the Metz collection, um, an autonomous finished work in which he employed brown ink, wash and white gouache or opaque watercolor on blue prepared or hand tinted paper. The brilliant burst of light behind the angel at center underscores his sudden and miraculous appearance out of the darkness to announce the birth of Christ. Like many a painter graveur or painter printmaker, La Grenet also engaged with printmaking. First in the early 1760s during his stay in St. Petersburg, Russia, where he made several etchings after and inspired by Rembrandt. And here I show you his brooding and muscular St. Jerome. And then when he was a pensionnaire in the late 1760s in Rome, where his encounters with classical art stimulated the creation of such works as this etched sketch plate of antique vases and fragments. Today, I will focus on La Grenet's next and most important phase of printmaking in the early 1780s, when he experimented with the relatively new technique of aquatint. Although invented in the Netherlands in the 1650s, 
Aquatint was not used broadly by European artists until the second half of the 18th century, a time of increasing interest in studying, teaching, collecting, and replicating drawings. Historically, aquatint was almost always combined with etching done in the plate first. By supplementing etching's line work with a means to subtly render tone, aquatint offered a new and exciting method to replicate ink and wash drawings, and especially when printed in brown ink. Aquatint first flourished in France in the 1760s, but by the time English artist Paul Sandby coined the term aquatint in 1775 in conjunction with the publication of his views of the Welsh countryside, he was but one of several European artists exploring the medium. And here I'm showing you on the left, the gondolier from Giovanni David's 1775 series, Diver Portrait. And on the right, I'm showing you one of the um, wonderful Welsh views from Paul Sandby's second uh, Welsh, Welsh series published in 1776. All right. The most basic form of the aquatint process involves a pulverized rosin being distributed across and being fused by heat to a copper plate. When the plate is submerged in an acid bath, the acid eats away at the exposed areas of copper around and between the resin particles. The human eye reads the speckled, the resulting speckled tone, this pattern of acid bitten indentations when inked and printed on paper as a tone. The appearance of aquatint varies depending on the size of the rosin particles, how long they've been applied to the, how they have been applied to the plate surface, and on how often and for how long the plate has been corroded by acid. Another factor, of course, is the inking and printing of the plate. So here I'm showing you on just the left, you can see a scattering of rosin particles across the copper plate. And on the right, I'm showing you a detail of Carlo Labruzzi's charming etching and aquatint of two Italian women from 1788. And as you can see, the longer the plate spends in the acid bath, the more the acid eats around the rosin particles and into the plate, the deeper indentations holding more ink and printing darker tone. If you would like, to learn more about the technique of aquatint, I would recommend consulting Crown Point Press's most excellent publication, Magical Secrets about Aquatint. In the early 1780s, aquatint was experiencing a second upsurge in interest in France, including its use in two major publishing enterprises that catered to the burgeoning interest in Southern Italy, not least the archeological excavations in Pompeii and Herculaneum. La Crenet's Academy colleague, Jean Huel, was hard at work on what would become his magnus opus, the Voyage Pittoresque des Îles de Sicile, de Malte et de Lipari, published between 1782 and 1787, in which he took a leading role in its realization as the author, publisher, and artist. The four volumes of interdisciplinary text are accompanied by more than 200 breathtaking aquatints based on watercolors that he made uh, during and after his Italian travels. And I'm showing you just three plates from the first volume, um, including vases, the temple at Segesta, and this incredible bird's eye view of the volcano on Lipari, the island, which we'll have the book open to in the exhibition. Significant too was the amateur Abbe de saint nons sumptuous travel book, Voyage pittoresque de Naples et de Sicile, five sumptuous volumes published between 1781 and 1786, illustrated with more than 500 prints by a team of artists. Um, and here I'm showing you from the first volume, Gutenberg's etching and engraving after a painting by Voler, showing the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 1771. Although the plates for these volumes, for the most part, were etched and engraved by various printmakers, it should be noted that saint non who was the most prolific aquatinter of the 18th century, created more than 20 of the tail pieces for the second volume, etching and aquatints uh, printed from two superimposed plates that replicated red and black figure Greek face painting. And on the left, you can see how you just discover these as you're going through the book, lifting back the paper, and then there's a detail on the right. When I say these are printed from two plates, the um, plate that is etched is printed in black ink over the plate that is aquatinted, that is printed in an orange red ink. 
Lacrenay's use of aquatint in the early 1780s was undoubtedly motivated in part by his desire to replicate and circulate his drawings, for which there was a strong market as demonstrated both by the growing number of his works for sale in French auctions from the 1770s and the 1780s, as well as his submissions to the Salon, where he showed more than 40 drawings between 1775 and 1783 alone. In the 1777 Salon, for example, number 43 in the livret or booklet was listed as, quote, two friezes highlighted with white or heightened with white on brown paper, unquote. Although this is not exactly the works that were displayed. Um, one might compare this description with the exquisite, highly finished independent drawing in Weimar that I'm showing you on the screen. All right. In the April 15th, 1785 issue of the Journal Encyclopédique or Universel, La Grenet placed, placed an announcement for, quote, a recueil or a collection of 20 different subjects, friezes, bas reliefs, and arabesque ornaments in the antique genre engraved in the manière de la vie. And I should clarify that in a late 18th century France, Manière du la vie was used to refer both to aquatint and to the printmaking technique of wash manner, which is a technique by which tone was created manually rather than chemically in a plate using special tools. All right, and here is the title plate for the series. Um, this brief description from the journal hardly prepares one for the experience of looking through a copy of La Grenet's Requet, which is an extraordinarily beautiful and sizable object. Here I am showing you the copy in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, which as you can see, when opened on a cradle, extends from one reading lamp to the next. Each sheet roughly measures 16 by 21 and a half inches or 40 by 54 and a half centimeters. Multiple copies have survived intact. Here I am showing you all 16 sheets from the copy at the Institut National de l'Histoire de l'Art, also in Paris. There are also complete copies in the University of Bern Library um, and also in Cologne, though I haven't been able to see images of that one yet. The Metz copy is complete minus the title page. The MFA in Boston has a version of this requay, though it's, it's different in format and contents. In addition, there are uh, individual impressions of these 20 aquatints in various European and North American collections. The NGA has six. As you can see, this requet is visually distinctive, not just because of La Grenet's use of aquatint printed in brown ink, but also because of its oblong, one might say quintessentially neoclassical format. Its dimensions accommodating the printing of the six long horizontal freeze-like compositions. And I'm referring to these up here. Several of the smaller plates are printed two, if not three to a sheet. See that in the bottom. Three of the complete copies I have examined, examined all have the same 20 aquatints printed on 16 sheets in the same sequence from large to medium the compositions from large to medium to small. Lagrenet date, uh, dated only four of these compositions. Three are inscribed with the date of 1782, title page, the still life and the harvesters. And only one is dated to 1784, and that's the Apollo plate here. This requet was announced for sale only a month after Lagrenet was appointed co-artistic director of the Sèvres porcelain manufactory by the powerful Comte d'Angevière, who is the Directeur General des Bâtiments du Roi, or the head of the Royal Arts Administration. The appointment of the versatile Lagrenet, who, as we have seen, was already fluent in antique-inspired forms and styles, was but one part of a larger strategic and ambitious plan on the part of the Comte d'Angevière to revitalize French manufacturing. In the case of Sèvres, he wanted to update the luxury goods it produced to reflect contemporary neoclassical taste and believed that such antique inspired designs would enable Sèvres to compete on the international ceramics market. 
During his tenure at Sevres, Lagrenet designed shapes and uh, the decoration of ceramics in what is referred to as the quote, Etruscan style, a misnomer since the works are really an amalgamation of Greek and Roman sources. And here I'm showing you one of the bowls he designed for the larger Etruscan service made for Queen Marie Antoinette's dairy farm at Rambouillet in 1787-88, which is in the Metz collection. And I'm juxtaposing that at lower right with another Sevres bowl, slightly different form, um, that was produced in 1784. So you can see the differences in styles. Lagrenet's designs were based on ancient examples that he could have studied in such volumes as Pierre de Dancarville's 1766-67 uh, volumes on the collection of Etruscan Greek and Roman antiquities assembled by Lord Hamilton, the British envoy to Naples, who sold his first collection of antiquities to the British Museum in 1772. Uh, and this is not an exact match in terms of form, but I'm just showing you to give you a sense of what these four spectacular volumes look like in terms of the prints that they offer of the ceramics um, from different points of view. It also has gorgeous hand-colored plates, as you can see with the title page here. Obviously, Lagrenet's aquatent enterprise was in the works long before this appointment, but this new position enhanced its desirability. The Roquet's launch in April 1785 enabled Lacrenet to cash in on his rising fame. And I think you can see with the title page, the ornamental motifs are similar to the ceramics. And I love that he included, of course, two little ceramic vases on either side. The term Roquet, coming from the French verb recueillir or to gather, means a collection or compendium of prints that reproduced or were related to the works of one artist. To clarify, this recue does not offer the complete output of prints by and after Lagrené. That would be an oeuvre. In fact, we know that there are other aquatants Lagrené made around this time that he did not include here. Rather, a recue is a discriminating, one might say a curated, selection of an artist's work. The beauty of the Requie was that it was an expansive category, one that could encompass a range of Lagrenet's aquatants loosely interlinked by le genre antique. Indeed, the Requie as a whole showcases his multi-layered approach to neoclassicism, one that would be appreciated by amateurs who would delight in close looking and pride themselves in identifying the multiple sources of inspiration for these compositions. For starters, this recue encompasses many classical or antique subjects. There is Athena or Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. There are war trophies and ancient vessels. There are architectural ruins. There are archeological and art historical references to Greco-Roman Greco art woven throughout the six larger aquatints, including the fanciful borders of grotesque ornamentation or arabesques as Lacrenet referred to them, that combine human and animal forms. And these, um, showing you three examples on the left, details. These nod to the decoration of the Domus Aureus, the Golden House in Rome, Emperor Nero's pleasure palace, which had influenced artists for centuries, including Raphael. And here I'm showing you on the right part of an etched and an engraved plate that replicates one of the fresco paintings from Marco Carloni's 1776 publication on the Baths of Titus at the Golden House. There were also famous classical sculptures like the Crouching Venus placed atop a column in the sacrifice scene print. Um, and I'm showing you on the right one of the many marble versions of this famous classical sculpture from Louis XIV's collection, now in the Louvre. There were also references to the 18th century French sculpture that was inspired by classical art. In one corner of one of Lacrenet's plates, we see a little variant of Jean-Baptiste Pigalle's Mercury fastening his wings on his sandals. And on the right, this is an image of the Louvre marble uh, from the 1740s. For me, one of the most compelling aspects about this recue is how Lagrenet has used aquatint to evoke, if not mimic, the appearance of ancient objects. And please remember that all of these uh, designs are of Lagrenet's own invention. So some suggest Roman wall paintings, 
And here we can see how figures assume dramatic gestures and poses that play out across a shallow freeze-like composition. We also have these incredible trompe l'oeil sculpted bas-reliefs with exuberant garlands and frolicking putti. And we have red figure vase painting. Um, each of these two compositions were printed from the superimposition of two etched and aqua tinted plates. Um, and I think you can see uh, the registration was slightly off. You can see the edges of the orange over the black here, but these are definitely being created in dialogue with saint Non's publication as well as Anconville's. Several of the aqua tints in this requay can be connected to earlier drawings and paintings. Some we know of or can identify through titles or descriptions of his works in auction catalogs or the listings of his salon submissions. Um, a small number are extant. And here I'm showing you two paintings that he exhibited in the 1783 salon in their original frames with reverse glass painting in the corners. The Toilette of Venus on the left and Sacrifice Scene on the right. And these are the titles he used to list them in the salon booklet. Juxtaposing the latter composition with the related aquatint, I think you can see how in the process of revisiting and recreating these works in aquatint, enabled Lagrenet to transform them, realizing original works of art in print form. These aquatints show an extraordinary degree of technical sophistication. In making these prints, Lagrenet displays the same facility as he would when making one of his wash drawings with brush. His acumen in this relatively new medium is undoubtedly informed by his drawing practice, his openness to experimentation, and his versatility. In each plate, Lagrenet used etching to sketch out the basic lines of his composition and articulate select details, but then he elaborated upon these forms, these designs in aquatint. Um, the works dating to 1782 in particular, of one of which I'm showing you a detail here, you can see how he's especially using lift ground or sugar lift, a technique that enabled him to create aqua tinted passages that have the contours of brush marks. Uh, and here you can see how he used the etching to just pick out the details of the base. But so much of the glorious detail in this work, um, including these just these plumes blowing in the wind or the foliage over here is entirely done in aquatint. And I should add that this detail and most of the details that I'm showing you of the aquatints are, are taken from the, you know, the copy of La Crenet's Requay in the University of Bern uh, library. As for the larger oblong works, many of these are primarily created through the alternation between the use of stopping out varnish and multiple bitings of the plate. Um, and here, just to look at one detail from the sacrifice scene, you can see, again, the more the plate is bitten, the darker the tone. Um, with then touches of lift ground to add final accents. And the lift ground is the hair, but also the details of the drapery, the shading that we see here. After La Grenade aquatinted his plates, he also sometimes modified certain tonal passages with scraping and burnishing. So he's using tools to pull back to remove that aquatinted texture from the plate. And here I'm comparing two impressions of the Apollo composition. On the left, we have a rich inky proof from the British Museum, um, which he pulled before he went back into the plate to create the highlights that lend volume and dimension to the God's uh, hair and drapery. So again, the barren copy, I think you can see the differences there. As all of the glorious details of his aquatints make clear, this requay is about Lagrenet's distinguishing his protean powers of invention and creation, a means to assert himself within the international movement of neoclassicism. As Elizabeth Rudy has demonstrated, the artist's prominent inclusion of his name in capital letters above the Toilette of Venus, one of the most striking plates in the entire Requay, effectively turns his name into a brand. And all the more appropriate given his new position at Sev. The 1785 announcement for this series 
specifies that it encompasses 20 aquatints. But there is still one other puzzling detail. This recoil of 1785 includes another recoil made a few years earlier. There are six horizontally oriented plates of almost the exact same dimensions. Three feature outdoor groupings or still lives of antique vases, architectural fragments and military trophies, all picturesquely overgrown with plants. Had Lagrenet acquired a stack of copper plates with the original plan of creating an interrelated suite of ornament prints that would showcase his abilities to create variations on a theme, but then his experimentation with aquatint prompted him to explore other subjects. Intriguingly, the two plates that show different subjects, it's the young harvesters here, and the um, plague among the Philistines are both inscribed with the number six after Lagrenet's signature. Was he contemplating the possibility of concluding the series with either work? Though none of the other plates in the group are numbered. Given that three of these plates are dated to 1782, including the title plate shown here, one imagines that Lagrenet initially planned to issue this recoil in the same year, but it isn't clear if this actually happened. Here, Lagrenet's name and his, the grotesque ornamentation of a wall-sized architectural fragment has arrested the gaze and is being contemplated by a family of Arcadian shepherds, the dark silhouettes of their figures set in contrast to the brightly lit stone. I haven't been able to find any separate announcements or listings for this uh, requay. The National Gallery recently acquired an impression of the title page, showing here, which is printed on a different laid paper than that of the 1785 requay, most likely a proof. And I should explain that I'm still in the process of gathering information on, on paper types and watermarks. Uh, indeed, the fact that Lagrenet incorporated the smaller 1782 requay into the larger 1785 requay is perhaps the best evidence that he made but didn't publish and distribute this earlier series beyond pulling a small numbers of impressions. The 1785 journal announcement provides one other piece of valuable information, the price. This requay of 20 aquatints was selling for 27 livres, which does translate as books, but that's the French monetary unit. As a point of comparison, one of Lagrenet's religious drawings sold at auction 12 years earlier for the same amount. Although this requay was by no means cheap, by 1785, it would be a more affordable option than purchasing one of the artist's drawings or paintings. For potential buyers, the 1785 Requay offered an artful assemblage of Lagrenet's versatile brand of neoclassical designs that was inspired by and synthesized an array of antique sources. All 20 compositions realized in the innovative medium of aquatint beautiful objects in and of themselves. Thank you. Thanks, Rena, for that uh, wonderful talk. I, um, I'd also uh, like to uh, thank Judy Hecker of IPCNY uh, and Shelley Langdell um, and Rena, of course, for developing today's event uh, and Jenny Gibbs of IFPDA uh, for hosting us. Um, I am going to share my screen and introduce uh, some of my works. Um, we, we, in our discussion, we talked about sort of introducing the work through process. And uh, um, after uh, watching Rena's um, program or lecture, um, it makes me really understand that this is sort of a um, an exercise in contrast, both figuratively and, and uh, literally. So I'm gonna sort of take you all through, uh, through this piece here um, and maybe just um, for the sake, it's a very large piece. So for the sake of um, being able to see what's going on, I'm just gonna sort of enlarge this um, and sort of scroll down. Um, this piece is uh, called Black Metamorphosis, and um, it is um, 
about 80 uh, inches long and 40 inches across and it's, it's back here in my studio um, and I'll maybe um, stop share and, and go over to it after, <clears throat> after we go through it. Um, I guess to introduce my work um, as briefly um, as I can and then maybe come back around to explaining a little bit more. Um, you know, I, in a, in a lot of ways, uh, thinking of La Grenet, I am in a sense um, thinking about the decorative, I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking about mythology and, um, and ideas of pleasure. And often I'm pulling references um, from mythology, um, from the same mythologies that uh, La Grenet is um, pulling from um, mostly in a, in a sort of, um, in a sense in a contrast to what um, um, he was doing. Um, I'm really thinking about um, drawing this sort of contrast um, around um, historical notions of, of beauty and pleasure that um, in relationship to uh, the black subject. And um, this question of how to represent a black subject is sort of at the center of of my work and and my thinking, um, I'm 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 often um, asking and wondering about um, you know what it means to represent the black subject without skin being this sort of central progenitor of meaning, and then uh, so then you know in in sort of I guess in, a, in sort of answer to that I've just sort of developed um, this um, body of work um, that. Um, takes on sub different subject matter over time, and we're definitely looking at one um, at one body of work that's that's fairly recent, where I'm cutting out of this black velour paper uh, and um, and collaging in images, um, collaging of um, uh, in, the, in this one black metamorphosis. The images are of butterflies and crystals uh, and African sculpture. Uh, in particular. Um, there are also elements that are painted, such as the hands here, um, and, then and then collaged in. Um, and these sort of little, what you see is little sort of flecks of, of white uh, floral. Those are actually cut um, areas and you can kind of see the play of shadow and light happening throughout this um, piece. Um, you're seeing the piece um, um, on top of a uh, white mat. Um, so there's this contrast uh, of, of how, you know, these, um, these elements, which I do think of as, as floral, as twigs and, and, and spores, um, things that migrate and can sort of um, find them uh, find them places uh, spread out around um, and then and then sort of regenerate. Um, so um, in that is you know uh, notions of diaspora and, and migration that often are uh, central central to what it means to be a black subject in the world, um, both in thinking about the American context and the global context. Um, so, I'm going to see here. Let's take this back and um, move through. So this is the piece in as it is in progress, uh, or it was. And I often sort of start with um, drawing on the verso in a, in a very loose way. Um, these pieces often start with a kind of, you know, uh, vision or not and, um, a, about um, a type of figure. And I'm really thinking about, you know, uh, a figure that sort of has energy that imbues a kind of uh, power, a life force um, that um, is sort of emitting, you know, um, trying to emit beauty, powerful, this is a transformation. And I think that those um, ideas of, of beauty, power, and transformation are central to the types of objects that I, um, and images that I, um, 
that I use reproductions of, um, which is uh, African sculpture um, and um, and crystals and geologic forms uh, and of course butterflies and um, in the, in a sense and and what they connote and um, culturally, um, and so I start there. I start sort of. Um, collaging these elements in on the ver on the verso, so I, I, I sort of intricately cut um, a kind of a hole or a window uh, for for the um, for the uh, applique, and and then I um, glue it from the back. Um, and I'll I have some images to show you how that looks a little bit. Um, and this is just so you can see the sort of, you know, I often, I often sort of, you know, when I'm painting an element or a, a portion of, I'm often um, putting in the paper, collaging the, the 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 raw paper, blank paper first, and then painting directly onto um, the piece, so that I can kind of see all of these elements coalesce and come together at the same time. Um, while I'm making it, and and though it is a sort of, um, you know, it, it has a lot of um, the pieces have a lot of stages. Um, it is a rather intuitive um, process of um, of of drawing and cutting and turning around and gluing on and um, and and thinking about um, filling in the space and density and and building density in the in the piece until it kind of. Uh, has this a sort of what I feel is a is a, is a sense of energy. Um, so this is an image of, so that you can see the the drawing on the verso and and how I'm sort of cutting uh, through um, and how you know uh, it, it's a very physical object um, in the end. Um, it, it be, and I, I it's because the the um, the paper itself is a velour paper, so velvet. It's velvet. It's this sort of deep, rich black um, surface that just sucks in, um, completely sucks in light. So often, in, when it's photographed, it it seems very seems very flat. Um, and here on the left, you can see that that how these elements are collaged in, um, and um, what you're seeing on the left is this sort of collage. Uh, and how they're, these elements are collaged in on the back and the back is really sort of funky and, um, and the front is very clean. It's almost like a magic trick of all the work on the back and then you turn it around and it's this sort of uh, fully realized um, um, thing that seems like not uh, the work has sort of disappeared. Um, and this is, these are some other pieces that I've done. Um, and just, you know, these are just studio shots to show you sort of how I'm working um, I have this big sort of wall in my studio where the, the, this that is lined with cutting mat, <laughs> and so I just kind of uh, put the, the the paper right there and stand and cut, and then let these pieces drop. and I collect them. I don't know what I'll do with them, um, but they'll find themselves in some other um, pieces. Um, and you can see on the on the uh, right here, this is. Um, all of these sort of elements that are uh, cut around this um, this di this ship diagram, slave ship diagram, all these elements that are cut around here are um, are going to be you know filled filled in with the reproductions of African sculpture and crystals and and in this case they're meteorites. Um, And this is, uh, I wanted to give you all a sort of image of what this looks like. This is 2019, the art show at the Armory um, with Susan Inglet's booth. Um, and um, the pieces are, um, you know, they're, they're framed uh, in, in, uh, in more or less in a traditional way. Um, but this will give you, gives you an idea of the scale. Um, so um, I sort of started this particular work um, uh, and like, like I said, sort of thinking about the, this way, the ways in which one can think about sort of representing uh, a black subject um, and, and how 
um, I could do that um, in a way that um, wasn't solely dependent on um, on skin color or you know um, as a as this kind of central idea, but thinking in and around and a kind of abstraction, you know, um, um, and and a kind of I, I guess a sort of poetry of what it might mean to feel like being in a, in a body um, or in, in a black body um, against this sort of backdrop of race in the in the in America in particular, but globally, um, which is this 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 sort of space in a sense um, of, of of being um, highly aware of fragility of being um, highly aware of um, or or in the flux of, of, of migration um, or in the flux of a kind of image culture and uh, that is always sort of moving between sort of decoration or, and demonization um, and how does one sort of um, you know how how does that look is my question not you know how does the how is this sort of interiority or the sort of eph ephemeral um, um, uh, the, these ideas that, that tend to be ephemeral um, find themselves um, you know, in a body or building a body or becoming the building blocks for a body. So I immediately went to this kind of um, floral work which was in my work previously in a, in a sort of totally different um, way. And uh, so this this uh, piece is called the gaze, and it's about forty inches by forty inches, and it's the, sort of the first in this series. Um, and and um, this is called seed. It's also a rather large piece, so I'll sort of give you a larger um, image of it here. Um, And again, I, you know, with this, I, I was sort of, as this idea was developing, I was thinking about this sort of um, analogy of, of this figure to a kind of plant life and, um, and, um, and how I could sort of continue to build that metaphor and, and, and with these, with the, the ideas of the of appendages or, um, or, or, or and skin and things like that sort of um, um, and disrupting that the space of these um, sort of floral forms and um, and cueing the viewer in on um, you know this sort of this hybridity or this um, this kind of figure that seems to be in flux um, in terms of how how it how it's forming or how it's how it be, how it's becoming visible. Um, um, I'm I'm bringing in um, you know folklore and uh, um, African folklore, looking at um, African masks um, often. Um, this one is based on a Galede mask, which usually has this sort of um, 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 uh, uh, sort of snake, uh, this sort of snake and bird sort of meta uh, uh, imagery um, that wrap around the, the, the head. And um, of course the sort of hands up image became, you know, um, a, a sort of form of protest really, um, you know, after um, the killing of, of Mike Brown. And, um, and I'm, I started this, this work and this body work really in the map, the aftermath of Tray, Trayvon Martin and the aftermath of, of Mike Brown. Uh, and, and, and it's uh, so many have, um, come after. Um, so the work in, in some ways has been, been sort of staying in this stay in this place and um, and um, in which um, the the issues around the work uh, and, and why um, they're being developed is sort of constantly sort of you know the sort of the outside world seems to be reshaping the, the work in, in a lot of ways. Um, and this is a print that I uh, did with uh, Graphic Studio in, uh, at USF in, in Tampa. Um, it's called Palimpsest, Palimpsest, excuse me. And it's 
on view right now at IPCNY uh, and in the Living in America exhibition. Um, and I have a, this is a shot of, of the gallery right now. Um, it's up, it's on view and you can, you can go visit. Um, I, this is a, this is a print and um, I, I do have this sort of relationship with prints and printmaking that is um, interesting in that a lot of, while, while I'm not, I, I wouldn't say that I'm a, a printmaker, I definitely came to develop in terms of my thinking about works on paper and painting through, you know, through printmaking. Um, and so a lot of ways, the ways in which I, you know, develop the pieces and think about applique um, uh, sort of are, are well suited in a sense to some processes and, and printmaking. This is, um, um, maybe you should zoom in on this as well. Um, so the way that this was made was um, the background is this kind of, it's this sort of puff paint. It's, it's really cool stuff where you, you, know, you silk screen it on and then you, in this heat, you heat it with a, with a blow dryer and it starts to puff up after a while. I went around the um, USF campus while I was there for a week or maybe, maybe two, maybe two um, sort of immersed uh, with um, the graphic studio team. And I went around and did uh, rubbings um, of the asphalt and manhole covers and uh, streets around in and around the, the campus in order to make these sort of plates, these silk screen plates that then were, um, we had multiple plates sort of uh, printed on top of each other and then we, we puffed them. So if you get close to the print, you, you do start to see some of those, um, some of the elements of the, uh, you know, the, the, the street um, and um, an infrastructure that you often find embedded in asphalt inside there and this sort of bumpy, bumpy texture. Um, the, uh, these are two sort of two hoodies that are just sort of photographed on the, on the ground. And I sort of, I, I sort of drew in and around them in there, in this iteration there of the print, they're laser cut, all these elements are laser cut um, out and the hands um, and the hands and the eyes are, are actually aquatent as well. Um, I really love, um, I'm still sort of thinking about aquatent and understanding it, but I love this sort of rich, sort of it has this sort of rich velvety um, surface that, um, that, that, you know, becomes achieved by the, the way in which the, the, the rosin sort of like lays on the plate. Um, still learning a lot um, about it. Um, so, so yeah, this piece is, um, is, you know, I'm really thinking about uh, many of the things I said before, this kind of cycle of, of, of violence and protest and erasure that sort of surrounds Black life and how and the notion of um, the, the sort of a figure that kind of is constantly sort of rewriting itself in a sense. Um, and then just to, um, oops, zoom out. And I'll move through the rest of these. Um, this is a rather large piece also about uh, 40 by 80 um, and it's called Odalesque was a slave um, and thinking about, there's a historical painting or Aang um, called Odalesque with a slave. Um, and I was thinking about, um, you know, this, the idea of pleasure and sexuality in that, um, in that painting with the, with the African eunuch in the background and, and, and sort of um, I, this trans, transpositioning or repositioning that figure to be the center and and sort of of the of of, of desire and um, and uh, and endowed um, back with his uh, sexual organs, um, and of course the fan in that painting is all about this idea of heat um, and and you know sort of being the kind of um, symbol object of, of of sexuality and desire. Um, this is a piece called Flex. Um, and uh, it's also, you know, as, as, I, as I work through these, these pieces, different things kind of in the cultural landscape come to mind and come 
into uh, my interest and um, and this one I was thinking a lot about the um, the um, the practice of flex dancing if, and, and, and the way in which the body um, sort of gets contorted um, and I think there's a there's a sort of uh, a, a type of flex dancing called bone breaking which is the dancers that have are double jointed or triple jointed um, which really um, you know is is really sort of both beautiful and disturbing um, thinking about that um, that movement and that idea in relationship and um, to this these ideas about a black subject and moving in the world and um, this is my last um, my last slide, um, it's called Beautiful Boys. And I am um, thinking here about, um, you know, notions of male beauty and the his history of male beauty. And this is at the center of this piece is this is a um, early Greek uh, curious boy. Um, and I really, you know, this is the, you know, this, this sort of statue that's it's pretty that you see it there's one in the mat um and there's much to do about its um its stance and um this pre uh, contra posto sort of stance um and it's um and it and it's sort of being this this sort of early idea of of, of male youth uh, um, and beauty um i also was really interested in those things because they those ancient greek paintings because they were all like painted and, and, and it's become this thing in art history um, in which um, uh, historians are now sort of pulling that idea back up that, that, these, I, that these things were originally in full color and painted and, um, and, and have evolved in the, in the cultural imagination of the, is these sort of white sort of um, pristine sort of um, objects in which Say you know artists in the Renaissance uh, um, thought of them that way, and and you know working and began working in things like marble and um, to, uh, to even heighten that sort of that that idea. Um, and I was just again the a, a notion of erasing the, the color on these things was like sort of fascinating to me. Um, this is also there's um, there's this a, a do rag here which is painted. This this is painted in. Um, and I really was loving the kind of visual language between how the do-rag sort of um, wraps around and drapes down and, and, and it's about sort of, you know, protecting curls or keeping the curls and the waves um, really tight and beautiful. And, and then this, um, this figure with this, this beautiful lock of, of curls and hair. Um, at the same time, you know, there's the, the, the the, the sculptures, um, the African sculptures and the, the butterflies and the crystals all in there sort of indicating a time, deep time change and transformation. Um, and maybe that, and this piece is centered around uh, notions, of, notions of beauty. Um, and that's my talk. Um, I um I'm in this I'm in my studio so and I was sort of asked to to maybe to give you a little bit of a uh, bit of a walk around so I'll do that very quickly um, and uh, so this is um, hopefully my uh, camera can get everything in view so just to give you I'm not sure if you can hear me from here but just to give you a, a scale sense of this piece. Uh, this is the piece that I, sh that I showed everybody in the beginning. Um, I, I'm working on um, collaging in these these, uh, these stones. I guess this guy is going to be sort of a stone, a, you know, a, a, a stone guy. These are all, um, that won't be the title. I haven't figured it out yet, but uh, I'm working with, um, a lot of black stones. Um, and when I say black stones, I'm thinking of things like charcoal, uh, coal, charcoals and coal, 
um, and you know, of course, diamonds that are um, coming out of that. Um, and so that I, I, in general, this is how these applicators sort of start. Um, uh, you know, I set these up on a page in Photoshop, and I give them space around so that I can sort of cut them out. Um, and I sort of painstakingly, I don't, I'm not sure you can see that, sort of trace, trace them and transfer these tracings, um, transfer those tracings to the back of a piece so that I know exactly where um, and how to place um, each applique. Um, and that's it. Um, that's my studio and my work. Thank you for listening. Hi, well, this is Rena. I can't get my video to start, but um, thank you so much for, ah, now I have a host request to start my video. There we go. Thank you so hey, much. Nice to see your face. Your I'm so <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm so glad we're in your studio this so you can show us the works. Um, and as you mentioned at the beginning um, of your talk, one of the things that interested me a lot was this, obviously these formal qualities, this idea of this dark matte quality between the aquatint and the, the velour papers that you use. And of course, I was thrilled to see your work from Graphic Studio using aquatint. It's amazing. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you came to work with the velour paper because I think of that as one of your signature materials yeah it's it's um so I I uh you know early I would say like as a young artist um a younger artist I'm still young um I was really thinking about painting and where my where my place was in that sort of in that in a kind of conversation of, of painting and art that I that you know I didn't feel represented me or you know, I didn't see myself in it. I didn't see people like uh, that looked like me in it, and 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 uh, and represented in a history. You know, even in the you know actual objects, you go to the Met, and it's like nine hundred, you know, nine hundred years of white people, people's history. Um, and um, I always struggled a little bit with the with all of the instruments of painting. You know, the traditional instruments of painting of of canvas and. Um, and oil paint and and um, and what was put to me as this you know a model of of what I should be doing and so it really kind of came out of me struggling with that and thinking about what other sort of ideas of art in my in my personal life you know like in, and I thought a lot about like my mom used to have these sort of velvet paintings and she she collected like really kitsch little figurines and stuff you know that represented black love and, um, and you know, it was, it was the 70s, you know? Um, and uh, so I was fascinated with those things really. And I always loved, you know, you know helping my mom pick out some strange figurine or whatever. Um, and um, I immediately kind of went to that and I started to think about what I could do with, with velvet. And so really I, I started, you know, early, like I would say like 2000, to um, was when I really started sort of asking that question. And then by 2004, you know, um, I was sort of um, making work on upholstery velvet, like wrapping it around uh, wood panels and trying to figure, try, trying to tussle with it. Um, and that um, evolved into me sort of finding my way to flocking and uh, which is a kind of, which is putting down a sort of glue or, or an, an adhesive and, and spraying fibers, small fibers over top of it and letting it dry, um, which is much more additive and much more flexible. Almost like putting rosin on a plate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. again, to get that texture, yeah. <laughs> which is so beautiful. Um, I, I have one more question, but I, I did also, um, Judy, thank you for the prompt. I just want to encourage everyone if they have questions to please put them into the Q&A and not the chat. Um, but uh, one other question I was thinking about um, apropos our earlier discussion and about your teaching is that, um, um, especially when you encourage your students to think 
about drawing from multiple points of view, you'd said it was, you know, it's like a place of invention. I love that that quote, you know, that it's like sculpture, it's performance, it's painting. So I was thinking, talking about how La Grenet is a peintre graveur, a painter printmaker who's simultaneously working across media. Do you feel like that your work across media, and that's where the velvet paper I think is interesting because you've pulled it into your work in different ways. You've made prints that kind of play with that same idea of tactility. Um, do you feel like your work across media has informed creation? Yeah, I, I think process more broadly. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've, I think I've always thought about, I mean, partly because of that sort of rethinking of materials and stuff, I think that that led me down a kind of path of, of, um, of sort of experimentation with, you know, with materials and things. So yeah, I, you know, I, I, I make panels on, I make, you know, paintings on panels, which you see back here, um, which I'm too shy to show right now. Um, but, um, and I, you know, work, um, um, on paper and um, sometimes it is straightforward drawing. Um, you know, right now I'm playing with just doing some charcoal, you know, straight up old school charcoal drawings. Uh, and, um, but yeah, but then it's this very, it can get really complicated in here with cutting paper and, and collaging and, um, and, and painting parts. And, um, and also just figuring out how to engineer near these things, you know, all comes out of that kind of like curiosity and, and also kind of a, uh, um, I think a, um, an experimentation that I found helpful in printmaking, you know, like all of the, the, the weight. So putting on an applique and, you know, and um, yeah, so I'd say so. Oh, so, well, we have a couple, we ha do have a couple questions um, that came in through the Q&A and, and one just to follow up since you were talking about the velour paper, there was a question about um, does the idea of representation through absence, uh, cutting out the figures in your work, uh, figure into your thinking about the works? Uh, do, you, do you use that cutting away as, an, as a reference to absence, I guess? Um, I do. Um, I do for sure. Uh, I'm thinking about um, cutting um, um, the, all of the all of the material aspects of the work for me are sort of rich for developing metaphor like that is this in it. So for me, the cutting is just as important as a you know as an image that's sort of collaged inside of it. And um, you know I've started um, you know there's this I think it's a um, I, I might be getting this wrong, but um, um, it might it might be Zora Neale Hurston, but Talk, talked about, um, you know, black people being viewed against this a sharp, you know, white background. And um, that's something that's always sort of landed with me. Um, and, and yeah, I'm often sort of thinking about that, uh, um, how absence becomes presence or how, you know, this, um, how the, what seems sort of ephemeral and visible um, can take shape and form and be held for a moment. I had a question, Will, um, since we were able to get a, a glimpse of your studio today, which is such a treat. You just fit about 120 people into your studio. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit what it's like to work with Graphic Studio. I mean, that place has no bounds, right, on scale, <laughs> on what material, medium, you know, inside, outside the studio. What's it like start to finish working there in the process? Um, it was it was pretty wonderful. Um, it was a long time ago when you could travel and and stay in hotels and stuff. So I you know I went to Tampa and I and and there's a a nice hotel like on campus um, on this sort of sprawling you know University of South Florida campus, um, and um, I got up in the morning every day and came over and um, talked, you know, talked with the team there about, you know, what, what kind of what I wanted to do. And it was wonderful being there because I could kind of just sort of look at, you know, there's multiple rooms of, of, of storage, the large, large areas where it's just sort of um, silk screen, a large area where it's sort of, of etching, a huge sort of area where it's just sort of digital um, sort of, um, you know, um, 
work and um, um, this, this space is sort of, I would say covered with all types of artwork that are the history of, of, of what um, the projects that have been made there. So you're, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're, you know, you can just pull a, you know, an Alex Katz or like, you know, or a Carol Walker and just sort of look at it for as long as you kind of want and, um, and think about, um, you know, these artists um, who, um, and, and how they're using, and then, and then sort of develop what you, you know, develop and um, everybody's just sort of, it's sort of weird to tell you the truth because it's like the, it's like the only, it's like, uh, you know, you feel like <laughs> really special. I would say, you know, like you feel like people are sort of waiting on you and just like, and if you, you know, if you kind of say, um, you know, sneeze, here's a, you know, here's a tissue. It's like, <laughs> but, but waiting for, you know, often waiting for, for you to, to, to kind of come up with an idea. And then as you know, you know, it's like funny with um, Tom um, from graphic studio, just sort of, excuse me. Um, I'm, I sort of just was like, okay, I want to, you know, I got up one morning, I was just like, I, I want to like, you know, rub the asphalt, you know, can we do this? And then we spent literally the whole day um, um, walking around campus and rubbing the ground and it looked weird and it was good, it was fun. Um, so, and then we pulled all that back in with, and, and, and you know, it's, it's just this wonderful thing to be able to have a half of an idea develop into a whole idea um, in, in, in community with other people um, who are not there to judge you, but to, to, to help you kind of come up with the best, you know, sort of, uh, possible, uh, iteration of what your idea is. So, um, yeah. So, well, we have a, we have another question, um, which I think you addressed somewhat, but, um, asking to you, if you could go into a little more depth about, um, your mention of pulling from mythology similar to La Grenée, um, and considering that Western mythology is overwhelmingly white, um, how do you transform it to relate to the idea of, of blackness? And you talked some about using African mythology and, I'm, and um, I wanted to then also extend that further to both of you um, to maybe address the issue of drawing from <clears throat> specific historic references that sort of have uh, authoritative or power constructs associated with them and how that plays a role in these works. Mm. Should I, should I take that first? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's it, in my work has definitely come up in, in different iterations. And I guess the earl, earlier work in which I was looking at these, this sort of history of uh, nymph and bather scenes, which um, you see in, in images that Rena showed us of Lagrenet's work uh, and thinking about how those um, images have, have given us this sort of longstanding um, sort of European standard of, of beauty and, I, and ideas of pleasure. And in you know, an earlier body of work, I was sort of dropping black figures into spaces, into, into spaces like that, developing spaces like that, um, but also, um, and also, um, um, bringing in ideas about um, primitivism or this relationship between um, early um, early abstraction, um, um, West, um, European and Western abstraction to um, African objects that um, in primitivism, it was said to have this sort of affinities was uh, the kind of word that they used to talk about um, that relationship. But we, we understood that what that was, was, you know, Europe looking to the African continent, looking to the, those objects um, for inspiration and, and for, for pulling in images. And it's very direct if you look at the, if you look at the work, um, the work side by side. Um, so I, so, you know, for me, um, I'm, I was thinking a lot about uh, mythology um, in a sense as me metaphorically, in other words, that um, often um, the black subject is, um, is sits within a kind of flux of images, um, I would say, um, and this is something that's been a sort of a subject of mine in, 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 uh, in um, curating the Black Pulp exhibition um, a, a few years ago um, at IPCNY, um, which is this this history, you know, this this long history of a kind of uh, image assassination. <laughs> For lack of a better word, that, but but also this history of of trying to, of um, um of publishers and and um, and artists trying to work 
uh, against that, um, that sort of, um, and so I, I think about that aspect of, of what it means to be a black subject in the world um, and how to find metaphors. So, um, you know, yeah, so, and I think in the earlier work, it was a simple, yeah, there's, 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 there's black Cupid, you know, there's black, you know, there, there's black Diana. Um, and, and, and what does that mean to see um, our, um, our bodies in that space um, of historic beauty and pleasure? And, and, I, and, I, and I think in, in these pieces that um, I'm doing now, I am much more uh, in the space of conjuring. I feel like I'm in the space of conjuring. I want what I want from the viewer in front of these things is a, is a feeling of, 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 of energy from them. Um, a feeling of healing um, um, for them to be spaces of healing and thinking about a body um, and, and about a black subject. So, and, and so, yeah, that, um, you know, often um, I am looking to those African, those African objects and sculptures and that relationship, of course, um, of, of those objects being pulled, um, extracted, as, as a kind of extraction as much as you know body uh, black bodies have been um, and how they kind of migrate and in in a sense um, find themselves with this <laughs> you know um, in that in that migration and in, in forced migration um, um, so yeah I, I'll stop there <laughs> uh, I Thank you for that. Well, I mean, for, for La Grenet, this is the 18th century. So this is uh, an artist who is um, growing up in um, being trained um, in studying, um, making art that is very much uh, modeled on the idea of the Western canon. Um, and that, that's enmeshed in the, the Academy Royale, which had been founded in the 17th century the work that Lagrenet made would be, it wasn't just that he studied it, incorporated it into his work, it was very much expected. That was seen as something to aspire to. Um, so it, it just was, it, you know, it's in his work, it was in his world through and through. And did you see, I mean, I think what I was, but did you see it as sort of, you know, in a way, could it be viewed as sort of propagandistic or sort of underscoring or, you know, building on that reference to that kind of power, classical power structure? I mean, is it sort of feeding into that larger cultural moment in the same way? I mean, through, obviously it's through distribution and those prints circulate and things like that. So, I mean, does it have that sort of undercurrent? I mean, I think it's, it's definitely part and parcel. I mean, that was just the thinking at the time, um, I mean, I don't, I don't think he was. I don't know if there was um, specific, you know. I mean, for him, I think this is more. He's working in the art historical realm, aesthetics, um, you know, historicism, classicism. I don't know how much he's taking it to power and politics, but in fact, I don't think he really is. But that's, I think, that's more what he's doing. Yeah. There. Are <clears throat> two questions, and maybe this will be the last one unless some more appear in the Q&A, but there are a couple of questions, Will, that relate to um, the cutting process. And if you prefer hand to laser cut with, with the velvet, how does that change your vision with each work and, each, and with each, towards each method? Um, and another question, you know, more about the cutting how you came to it and how it perhaps relates to drawing or printmaking other other mediums. So if you could tell us a little more about the different ways you cut and what they mean. So, but yeah, you saw my my uh, exacto blade. So I um, you know, I um I kind of sit in and knowing that I'm up I'm up against the kind of technology of 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 um, of laser of laser cutting. In a sense, and I've and I've always thought about like what it meant, what I, what I want from the work, um, and so yeah, with the I've the cutting has almost come to be like as fluid as drawing is is just drawing with the with the pencil, um, and it, it definitely asks for a quite a, quite a lot of focus, but I think people who 
who render um, really are, are in the same space. So for me, the I guess the the hand cutting is just about a, a immediacy. Like I, I kind of for now, you know, I kind of don't want to sit on the computer, um, putting putting together a file and and Photoshop and then and and then sending that to, you know, to to a machine and and then seeing this thing on the end. I kind of there's ways in which I think um, that there is a transformation, a tr transferent of it, of energy in me drawing um, with my hand, and then and then sort of following that that um, following that energy with the knife um, and cutting out. So um, yeah, um, I, th I think that that's my that that's my relationship to it. That it kind of feels as if I'm 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 really in a space of immediacy and 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 drawing really. Just as a really quick follow up, there was a question um, from a curator about whether the cutting, if you think about the silhouette, the practice, the historical practice of silhouette. Um, yeah, like kind of like when you when you um, put the person against a, a screen and then draw their you know, silhouette and stuff. Yeah, I think that that's I think that that's cool. I love silhouettes. Um, and um, I thought a lot about, um, um, but I, I, yeah, I haven't really, I haven't really used them in, in the work, um, but um, I think that there is a kind of, um, mm, there's a kind of thing that happens in a silhouette where um, the, the, the figure or the, or the forms kind of get, uh, uh, sort of ambiguous, you know, like you can have two forms together or have a multiple forms together and there's a kind of ambiguity of when they, where they start and begin. Um, and there's also a kind of life inside the, 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 the silhouette that is seen, that is kind of surpri quite surprising, you know, that like even that um, the kind of idea of a representation or energy or identity is sort of held even within that, it's kind of outer form. So, yeah. Well, um, thank you, Rena and Will, both for these fantastic presentations and some wonderful questions um, as well from the audience. And thank you all for joining us here today. Um, Judy, it's been great collaborating with you as well as, as the speakers and Jenny. And we will want to remind everyone that this is gonna continue for two more Fridays um, where we have next week, we have Jennifer uh, Farrell and Yashua Klaus, and they're going to be talking about early modern um, uh, subjects from Jennifer Farrell, uh, and we will have more questions and opportunities then. Um, please do sign up on the uh, Print Month website um, for IFPDA, and we'll look forward, hopefully, to seeing many of you at that time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Thank you.